All right, let's turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Verse number one, it says that after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So we've been talking about uh, cooperation amongst believers, uh, the, the fellowship, the unity and the work that we have together. We, we started that in the first lesson by kind of giving an overview about the nature of our uh, unity. Uh, the, that foundational point, and then we gave some of the basic exhortations that the Bible gives us to that, to that cooperation and fellowship, uh, the divisions that, that we often allow in. The Bible speaks of those, you know, being carnal, being fleshly, spiritually minded people in the local church are working together. Last time, and, and we skipped a week last week uh, being away, but the, the last lesson we talked about some of the benefits and blessings of cooperation. Today we want to talk about the design of cooperation. We're going to talk about the need that we have for assistance and help in the work. We see an example of that here as Jesus sends out his disciples to go two by two. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is complementary Christianity. Complementary Christianity. And that's complementary with an E, uh, not complementary with an I. Um, so do some definitions there and, and look up the difference. But we are talking about those things that go together. So let's talk about this concept this morning, uh, complementary Christianity. Uh, five things that I would like to look at. The first, one, um, the first one would be the difficulties of dedicated service. The difficulties of dedicated service. Now, if you want to take this text here that we've used... Uh, and keep it in its context. It says there in verse number one that after these things, you're reminded of what Jesus Christ had just previously taught. If you look at chapter nine, chapter nine, Jesus dealt with the subject a couple of times of, of counting the cost, right? In, in Luke chapter nine, uh, let's hit verse 23. Luke chapter nine, verse 23, it says that he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Just a few more verses down, if you jump to verse 57. Verse number 57 says, It came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. Uh, but he said, Lord, suffer me first, go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home in my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Chapter 9 here mentions again a couple of times the difficulties, the, the necessity of counting the cost. Following Jesus was not something for the disciples to look at flippantly. We use that word. The word flippant means to deal with, some, to, to deal with something serious in an unserious manner. And they were not to just be rash about that. They were not to look at the service of Christ um, in an unserious manner. It, it's a serious subject. And so to those that would say, well, well, what did he say in verse 57? This one guy says, well, I'll, I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, will you follow me when you won't have any idea what's next? You know, I, I don't know where I'm sleeping half the time. You know, I, I don't know where I'm going to lay my head every night. You going to follow me through all of that, or are you going to continue to follow me um, through the unknown? Uh, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. I don't have that, and and, and that is implied. There, there's an implication in there that following Christ likely puts you in the same boat. So that's the context, right, of chapter 10 when he says, after these things, after those things that the Lord had just previously said that he had taught. But if you continue on. 
in this passage in Luke chapter 10, it says, Therefore said he, verse 2, chapter 10, verse 2, the, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. That, that is an implied difficulty, right? We, we are going into the midst of a hostile crowd at times, that we are, we are lambs um, among wolves. Verse number four continues another potential difficulty. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. And salute no man by the way. Um, following Jesus, going out as he has commanded was not, not the way to earthly glory. It wasn't the way to wealth. It wasn't the way to fame. Um, they, they were to go you know, empty-handed basically. Don't, don't carry you know, belongings and such. Don't let those kind of things weigh you down, be a burden to you. Go carrying not those things. In verse number 10, they were promised that there, there's not going to be a guarantee of reception. It does mention in verse number 6 that, it, you know, if, if the Son of Peace be there, um, well, verse number 5, in, into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house, and if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it, and if not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating, drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. You know, when you find a place that will have you, you know, enjoy the fellowship that is there. Um, but, verse number 10, into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you not, go your ways out of the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. There are going to be difficulties in dedicated service. Now, obviously, Christ told them in the previous chapter, count the cost. And in this, in sending them out by twos, he warns them, uh, you're, you're lambs among the wolves, and you're not really going to carry much through this world. Don't carry purse and scrip and bag and uh, shoes and, and all of those things. You're not going to be well received everywhere you go. There are difficulties in serving Jesus. It helps to have help. And the disciples were sent, but they weren't sent alone. Uh, even the most zealous follower of Jesus is going to have challenging days, days when it's hard to persevere, days when it's hard to keep going. Going out two by two would have helped them. There's going to be days, obviously, when <laughs> one of them's going to worry, one of them's going to have doubts. It helps to have the other person there to reassure them the words of Christ, to reassure them in, in confidence and to encourage them. And likewise, when the shoe is on the other foot and it's the other one that is discouraged or the other one that has doubts and worries. Remember what we said last time in Ecclesiastes 4, in verse number 9, Ecclesiastes 4 and verse number 9, it said, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. And Christ warned them, right? That there, there's, no, there's no looking at this obnoxiously or flippantly. Dedicated service comes with a cost. It's not easy. It, it's easy to say, well, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, there are difficulties in that. That starts by not, you know, often not knowing what's coming next, not knowing where you'll sleep that night, going as lambs amongst wolves, going to places that won't well receive you. But he didn't send them alone. And so it's good and encouraging to have help. And that's why we need to, we work together so that none of us is indeed um, out here trying to serve Jesus alone. That's, that's the fellowship and the blessing of having the local church here. Number two, uh, the, the second thing I would say is the effect of two witnesses. The effect of two witnesses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, mm -hmm. 
Paul establishes here something that they would have been familiar with, um, hopefully, but I think we're familiar with it, definitely. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1, it says, This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The effect of having multiple witnesses. Now that is, um, that is the base foundation of witness in the Old Testament. In the book of Deuteronomy, it speaks of, of in the mouth of two or three witnesses having things be established. When there is any accusation, when there is any challenge against someone, if there is not an admission or a confession, then the truth of that matter must be established in the mouth of multiple witnesses. It's not... It's not incredibly keen on, on one person's word against another person um, trying to establish fact based on that. Um, and so the rule of witness given to us in the scripture is that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. It helps to have backup. It helps to have someone amen what you say. It helps to have someone there in agreement to establish the same facts that you are trying to portray as well. Jesus spoke of those things in John chapter 5 when he said in verse number 31, Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Um, Christ, of course, he's not saying there that, that well, if, I bear, if I'm the only one that says this, then, then it must be a lie. No, but he understands that the rule of witness is that Things are established in the mouth of multiple witnesses. But that's kind of Christ's point there is that, you know, it's actually not just me saying this. And he goes on in the rest of this chapter to give the multitude of witnesses that also testified on his behalf. Jesus spoke of John the Baptist testifying of him. He spoke of the Father testifying of him. He spoke of uh, the Old Testament testifying of him, right? Ye search the scriptures, in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He spoke of his own works testifying on his behalf. So Jesus is kind of, kind of saying the same thing. I know what you would say. If I were to establish or if I were to say, if I were to witness of myself, it wouldn't be true. You, if it was just me saying it, you might be justified in doubt or skepticism. But Christ would say, there's a number of those things that bear witness of me. Having some, you know, skepticism is a real thing. It is a real thing amongst all kinds of people, right? When we deal, when we deal with the world, obviously we're dealing with people that are skeptical of Christianity. Um, Skepticism, though, it kind of everywhere. Like, I, I'm reminded, Brother, Brother John's been teaching through the book of Acts. Um, and, you know, after Saul had been saved and he comes back to Jerusalem, uh, not everybody was on board right away, right, to, to receive him and to jump on that. Um, but, but it, you know, what it, it took the voice of another. It took the voice of another one like Barnabas to come along and kind of assure folks and kind of, you know, ease some of that tension and that doubt that was there. Having another person on common ground preaching the same message is helpful. Um, a, a church is well established and um, it's on a better footing when those that are, are speaking on its behalf are in agreement and are teaching the same thing. I mean, it would obviously be utter confusion if Brother John got up here on Sunday morning and said one thing, and I got up on Wednesday night and I said the complete opposite of that. You know, obviously that would be unethical anyway, but, but it, it just would be mass confusion. It'd be confusion to everyone that would be listening to it. This effect of having multiple witnesses to say the same thing um, makes it work. It makes it work a lot better. And so that's what we try to establish, and that is the help that we have in having multiple of us working together. Let's turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Again, we're talking about complementary Christianity, that this working together, Christ sent them out by twos, and the blessing that it is to, to work together. 
and the need that we have for that, the difficulties of service, the importance of having two witnesses. James chapter 5, we also see the importance of working together in the subject of accountability. Okay, accountability. In James chapter 5, in verse number 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There, there's, there's certainly a danger. In, in the things that you would try to fight or the things that you would try to battle alone. But it's interesting what he says here in verse number 16 where it says to confess your faults one to another. Now there is an unhealthy extreme that you can take this verse and some do take it. There, there's a very large group of people that, that take this to that unhealthy extreme. This confession of our faults one to another is not... Um, this word deals more with those, um, those slippings or deviations this is not, we, we would not take this to the extreme of uh, looking to each other for forgiveness of sins. Our confession to each other is not, is not of every single sin that is in our life. This is a confession of our deviations and our, and our slippings and our temptations amongst each other. Confessing our faults one to another. Um, we need to do that. We need to have people locally, people that are close and people that are spiritual to help us remain accountable, to be accountable with and for each other. Having someone to challenge you or me, having someone to challenge and help us is a good thing. Having someone there to pray for you, having someone that you can be honest with in confession of faults is helpful, right? Having help makes it easier. It doesn't make it easy, but it does make it easier in things like, you know, even resisting temptation. When you've got someone that you are in, in unity with, and when you've got someone that you're working together with, um, when you know that they are praying for you, and you know that they're going to question you and you know that they're going to ask about you and you know that they're going to check up on you. When you know that you have someone regularly that you can, you can confess faults and request prayer with and, and those things, that, that helps, right? That, that, that when I know, boy, that this person, I know they're praying for me, they're going to ask, that, that, that's important. That is helpful. Um, confess your faults one to another, pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of righteous men availeth much. We learn from the scripture that the lonely, those that are going about this on their own, they're, they're more vulnerable. Right? Now, our adversary walks about like a lion and seeking whom he may devour looking for those that are vulnerable, looking for those that are susceptible to temptation, to, to the things that he would set in their path, to his attacks. Um, all the way back to the beginning, right? We, we think of how he approached Eve. He approached the, the, the first, with the first denial, with the first sin. Having help helps. Having someone there that we know we are going to be accountable to, that they're going to check upon us, that they are going to ask about us, that they are going to pray for us. That, that, that incredibly helps, right? Now, now we see it today. It's, I, I think of places that, that, that are very strong on things like accountability partners, right? People who question each other, that, that look to each other regularly. When people are struggling with something, right, with, with like, a particular, um, like a particular sin or a particular, you know, may, maybe this person realizes that they, they struggle. When, when they get alone with the Internet, that's not a good thing for them. So they have someone that, that regularly checks up on them, right, someone that can monitor to them, someone that helps them with that. And when you have someone that you can be accountable to, that's, that's intended to be a help for them. 
That is what we are here and what the local church ought to be, a place where we can confess those things that we, um, we struggle with, we can confess our faults. We're, we're not talking about looking to each other with every sin that we've committed, nor are we looking for the salvation of those sins uh, in each other. But those troubles and slips and deviations that we have, it's good to have help. It is good to have somebody that you can honestly confess to and say, listen, I need you to pray for me. I'm struggling with this. Can you help me? Can you, can you hold me accountable? Can you, um, can you be there for me? D don't, don't sleep on the importance of that, right? Uh, having someone protects us. It protects us from falling to temptation. Uh, it also helps, you know, if you think about accountability, um, having people working together protects even from um, the other side, the flip side of that, right? It protects you from, from false accusations. I, I, can't, um, I can't neglect to mention that part of it. You know, when we, go, when we go places, right? It's important when we go out and we go two by two or we go in, in groups. That is a help because it protects us. The devil would love nothing more than to, to greatly hinder our testimony, even if it's by way of false accusation or, um, you know, just, just out and out lies uh, about us. I'm reminded of, you know, times that we go, let's say we go out and we're knocking on doors or we're out in the community and we're talking to folks. Um, having two people together is certainly better than somebody going alone to try to do that, right? You know, if, if one person's going alone, that, that, that's great. Um, but, you know, if, if someone's out there and they're by themselves, let's, you know, you imagine a guy that's out there and he's knocking on doors or he's in the community, he's by himself. He gets invited into somebody's house. He can't go into someone's house like that. You know, I, if a woman answers the door, yeah, come on in. I'm like, I don't know that that's great, right? You, you, you want to protect yourself at all times. You want to be accountable at all times. Having someone with you, having another person, just makes that work. We can fight more effectively, certainly, with help than we can alone. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the more you look at it, there's just, just more and more reasoning and more and more um, good evidence to why cooperation and working together is certainly um, the right way. Fourthly, I would say this. The nature of some gifts was complementary in a way. Okay, now... In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we, we are talking about some of the spiritual gifts that were given, even gifts that in one sense don't even exist any longer, that aren't necessary any longer. Maybe they were necessary in the first generation, um, but aren't now. But let's look at those. 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now the nature of some of these gifts are complementary anyway. Some of these gifts go together. They have to go together. The, the person that has been gifted with the ability of tongues, right, with, with the speaking of tongues, he, he's, he's rendered useless without the complement of he which can give interpretation of tongues. You come over to chapter 14, and Paul wants to talk about an orderly operation of the church. Let all things be done decently in order, he says in verse number 40. But, but that's at the end of the conversation, right? That, that's not a nugget that's just thrown in there by the member. By the way, just keep things orderly. No, he has given them direction in how to do that. Verse number 23, chapter 14, verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there are come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, Will they not say that ye are mad? 
If you have a church service and, and you've got this random speaking of tongues, this guy over here and this guy over here and this guy over here, we're, we're going to have to put, we're going to have to stop that because if you've got unbelievers or if you've got unlearned, um, you all look crazy. And in verse number 26, here's what he says. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, he's not telling him not to, but he's going to guard it. Let it be by two or at most by three, and that by course or in turn, that's not everybody getting up and speaking at once, do, do it by course, do it in turn, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. When you see modern day tongue speakers, and there is no interpretation of tongues, uh, they're not even following the biblical gift of tongues anyway. That, that is not the order in which Paul set forth in the church. If you're going to speak, let's keep it to a minimum, couple, two, or at the most by three, orderly, let it be by course, and somebody's got to interpret. If there's no interpreter, don't even worry about it. Because don't, don't even start because you're not going to help anybody. These gifts are given to edifying. Nobody's edifying anybody when, when I get up and I just speak in tongues. And you don't understand what I said. You're only edified if somebody interprets what I said. Well, there you have complementary gifts, right? One person speaks in tongues, and then you have another one interpret. My gift, in a way, is rendered useless without another person being able to exercise and work their gift. Verse 29 kind of gives a similar idea with the gift of prophecy. Now, again, when we talk about prophecy, we're not necessarily talking about foretelling the future as much as we are forthtelling God's Word, that, that, that revealed Word of God um, that hadn't been written yet, that there, there's no finished Word, there's no completed written Word yet, but being able to speak, thus saith the Lord by divine revelation. Okay, let the prophets speak, two or three, and let the other judge. You know, before there was a completed scripture, if I wanted to speak, thus saith the Lord, you know, that's the gift of prophecy. But there's also the gift of discerning spirits. There, there's the gift of judgment there where uh, someone would need to speak in agreement to that, right? If, if I get up here and I am speaking, thus saith the Lord, you know what helps? An amen, uh, you know, an amen from someone that can say, yeah, yeah, amen, verify that that's the truth. And that's what would have been needed in that age. When one stood up to prophesy or speak by divine revelation, there really needed to be a second. There needed to be a confirmation of that. So, so these, these gifts, and, and when obviously we're talking about the first age, we're talking about the first generation, but there are gifts that would have been complementary. The, the church was not to be a disorganized mass or mess. God, in verse number 33, is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So when he gets to the end of that context and he says, let all things be done decently and in order, he was able to look at their services and say, y'all aren't even working together. You, you, you've got people that are using their gifts to self-edification. That's not what the gifts are for. These gifts work together. One person speaks in tongues and someone interprets. If someone prophesies, then the judge, then, then let another judge so that things can be done decently and in order. Let me give you one more. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Fifthly, I would say that a functioning church is built on agreement. A functioning church is built on agreement. We're familiar with this. Verse 18. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be, loosed, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The church, the local church of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is, is visioned here and seen as working with the authority, right? They've been given the keys of the kingdom. Heaven recognizes that by binding the same things, by loosing the same things. In chapter 18, we see that similar language of binding or loosing. And it says here in Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, Verily I say unto you, verse 18, Matthew 18, 18, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you that if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, Matthew 18, 20 is not about four Christians that get together for breakfast uh, at a restaurant, okay? Well, we're gathered here together in his name, and, and, and he's here with it. That's not really what that's talking about. He's been talking here in the previous passage about a church that is functioning, right? And a church that is functioning is a church that is in agreement with each other. Now, the last passage was about, um, Matthew 18 was about, the disagreement that was in the church and, and the one goes to another and then he takes another couple with him and then when he won't be heard, he tells it to the church. And then the church makes a decision. The church makes an agreement about how to handle that situation. And what you bind on earth is bound in heaven and what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And if you are in agreement as touching any of those things, it says there in verse 19, it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven. A church that is functioning is built on agreement. The church is not at its best. The church is not functioning the way that it's supposed to when everyone's pulling their own way, when everyone has their own um, schemes and devices uh, about which, which way the church should go. When there is agreement, when the church is together and unified and functioning accordingly, it apparently sounds from the scripture like they can, they can accurately and faithfully execute the authority that Jesus Christ gave it. And, and heaven recognizes that, okay? Churches that are in agreement and functioning the way that they are ought to, it is absolutely fair to say they have the backing of heaven. They have the backing of the Lord and that, that is how he designed it to work. Compare those passages, put together Matthew 16 and 18, and uh, that, that's how I understand that, that, that a church that is functioning the way that it ought to in, in spiritual agreement um, certainly can say that they are working with his authority. Complementary Christianity. I, I think just from the five things that I was looking at here today, uh, this idea of together, this idea of working together, of cooperation, um, necessary. It was necessary. It's helpful. The, the difficulties that we face, the help that we have in multiple witnesses, the help that we have in accountability. Um, in another age, gifts were complementary anyway. It's just we see it over and over again that this thing works as we work together. All right. Father, we're grateful to come this morning. Thankful for the time that we've had to, to go through these lessons and I